Uh, welcome to Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver has a favorite place in my heart because I was born here. Um, and welcome to the Cover Bond Conference. Um, I'm Jerry Marlette. I'm a partner at Mayor Brown in New York, and it's been my privilege to work rather extensively with the Canadian cover bond issuers. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to interview our keynote speaker, Sandra Thompson. Um, Sandra has more than 25 years of experience uh, in housing finance and in the residential mortgage business. And um, in, the, in the course of this, of asking questions, um, I would just remind you that you have a conference app. With that conference app, you can propose questions, and I'll try to keep track of, of those as we go through. And I'll try to have a, a, a question and answer session at the end. Um, maybe for the first thing, Sandra, is you could tell us um, what you did before you came to FHFA. How far back yeah. do you want to go? And, and how, how that experience prepared you for what you're doing today. Sure. So, um, yeah, I started my career in Milwaukee at Northwestern Mutual, worked there for four years, then moved to New York and worked at Goldman Sachs for uh, four years. Actually, this was while they were still a partnership, so that was a long time ago. And unfortunately, my timing is always um, not very um, profitable. I left before they became a partnership, uh, before they, became, they went public. But um, I worked at Goldman Sachs and I worked in the mortgage research area. And at the time I worked there, there were a number of people who you may have heard of that worked there. You know, Bob Rubin was the head of fixed income. He wasn't ne necessarily a partner. Uh, current Secretary Steven Mnuchin was there. Uh, just a host of people who are now rich and I am not. Having said that, <laughs> <laughs> having said that though, um, I left uh, Goldman and moved to Washington uh, after uh, having two children. It was really difficult to continue to work those all-nighters when you got a you know, two-year-old and a, a small child at home. So I moved to Washington, played golf for eight months, and ended up working for the Resolution Trust Corporation, which was the agency that President Bush first won, established to deal with the assets that uh, lingered from the failed savings and loan crisis. So I moved from the RTC to FDIC. I worked at FDIC for 23 years. And in my last position, I was the head of risk management supervision and was responsible for the supervision of the uh, banks around the United States. So FDIC at that time had about 6,000 banks that we were responsible for, but as insurer, we were responsible for all insurance that had, all banks that have deposits. So I worked with uh, Sheila Baer to uh, work through the crisis. And after that, um, I was asked to come and work uh, for the debt, for the, um, Federal Housing Finance Agency, where I currently serve as the Deputy Director for Housing Mission and Goals. And I should mention that at the RTC, I was the Director of Securitization, and we had the government issue uh, its first securitization that was not fully backed by the federal government. We had re reserve funds at that time, and, and we did the first commercial mortgage-backed security, first multifamily. So a lot of mortgage experience um, over the years, and I can say this after having worked through two crises and now one mortgage crisis that is not, I mean, it's over, but there are so many unresolved questions. I think I'm done with crises for now. And I think what you told me this morning was you, you, you see the same things happening over and over again. Yes, yeah, the same, everybody gets amnesia. Like it's 10 years since the last crisis and you know, interest rates are rising, so a number of issuers, at least in the United States, are moving from a refinance market to a purchase market. And they're, because our stock is so short, you're starting to see a loosening of some of the credit standards that were put in place after the crisis, which were put in place to deal with some of the issues that uh, manifested themselves in these poorly underwritten loans. So you're starting to see an easing of credit uh, you know, they're just starting to see a shadow, not necessarily a shadow banking system, but a shadow servicing systems. Banks are starting to get out of the practice of um, service, sure. out of the servicing business, and it's mm -hmm. moving to non-banks. And so I'm put f trying to figure out, you know, what are, are, they, are they well capitalized? Do they have liquidity? What happens 
if these entities go out of business. And fortunately, you know, because many of them are counterparties of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, we're able through Fannie and Freddie to put through put forth capital and liquidity uh, requirements for many of these entities. But you're starting to see, I mean, it's like people just forget what happened in the past and the same issues come up, you know, I guess of every 10 years or so. Could I ask you maybe just to take a moment and tell us what the, what the objectives of the Division of housing mission and goals are? What's sure. It? So I think I mentioned in my remarks that uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are under conservatorship and we supervise them. And when they're under conservatorship, um, we have authority to make decisions and we use a delegated model for uh, the two enterprises because we cannot, you know, we've got, we're a 500 person agency and some of the resources are dedicated to the federal home loan bank system. But we are responsible for many of the policies and procedures that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have. You know, we have servicing requirements that we allow them to engage in. We have underwriting and origination practices. We pretty much are involved in almost every aspect of everything that they do mm. um, on both the single family side and the multifamily side. In my shop, I've got a, the research team reports to me. I've got um, responsibility for uh, guarantee fees, which I mentioned earlier, the credit risk transfer program, a number of the uh, mission activities of both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the affordable goals program, uh, the duty to serve program, uh, like non-performing loan sales, re-performing sales, securitizations. So I just, I've got about five different offices that report to me and just responsible for most of the activities for Fannie and Freddie. In given that position, what, how do you see the state of housing finance today? Is it healthy? What's it, where's the risk in the system today? Well, this, the state of the housing finance system is healthy, but I think I said earlier, until we figure out what is going to happen with Fannie and Freddie, it's been in limbo. There's been uncertainty. Nothing's broken. I think the housing system is pretty robust. Um, interest rates are you know, rising, so it'll change the dynamic of what they purchase, but there really are no issues per se. There's no crisis per se uh, in the U.S. mortgage market. You know, on one hand, people say that they want more private sector participation, but on the other hand, nobody's taken any steps to bring certainty to the future of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and so much hinges on that. No matter what they decide, and there are a number of decisions to make, a decision would be very helpful so people mm -hmm. could just move on. But to operate with both $5 trillion in assets um, in limbo just seems uh, quite challenging. That, to me, seems like the biggest risk in the housing market today, the uncertainty of what's going to happen with Fannie and Freddie. But what I hear you saying, actually, is kind of ironic that we shifted most of the of the risk in housing finance from the private sector to the government. That's correct. So that's kind of the next step. In, in your view and your, your personal view, what's the proper role for government in the United States, at least in, in housing and housing finance? Where should the government be trying to assist and, and benefit? Well, I, the politically correct answer, which I'll say um, is, you know, that's a decision for the Congress to make. I, I don't think that the government backing 90% of the mortgage market is appropriate or relevant. I think that it is, uh, there is a role for the private sector. And I'm not really sure that anything can happen until, you know, the Congress takes action or just something again is done mm -hmm. with Fannie or Freddie. I mean, people could do cover bonds today. They just, they can. There's no impediment. I think most people would feel as though there were, um, they, they'd have a better or robust market if there was legislation that was enacted that would give investors, I think, more confidence in you know, moving forward with a covered bond market. But I think that, again, that conversation gets muted until people feel, figure out what they're going to do with Fannie and Freddie. That is such a big issue 
in the uh, mortgage finance market, it, in the Congress, it, it just has just universal impact. And again, the mortgage market is 25% of our, our GDP. So I'm trying to figure out why we haven't um, come together and taken a step to resolve the issue one way or another. On a, on a more narrow point, um, residential mortgage, the, the origination of residential mortgage loans has changed since mm -hmm. the crisis as a result of uh, the Dodd-Frank Act, mm -hmm. and in particular, the, the QM rule for the ability to repay rule for, for residential mortgage loans. H how do you see that affecting the availability of mortgage loans to, to, um, to people who are less well-to-do? Well, you, um, so you look at why was the QM or ab ability to repay rule placed in Dodd-Frank to begin with one, people were getting loans they couldn't understand, loans with these teaser rates where you start out with you know, a very low interest rate for two years, and then after two years or three years, the rate would jump to something that they couldn't afford. They were called the payment shock loans. Then they had loans, um, the NEGAM loans, the negative amortization loans, and they didn't understand those. So people, anybody could get credit. Uh, I shouldn't say anybody, but there were many people who got loans yep. that probably should not have received loans. So, and I do think that guardrails are important in terms of providing uh, access to credit. But I do believe that the QM rule or ability to repay has provided responsible access to credit and certainly the capital treatment on residential mortgage loans, capital treatment on residuals has not necessarily been helpful in terms of uh, bank participation in, in doing uh, or retaining a loan that is a non-QM loan. I, I have a question here from the audience. I, okay. I'll, I'll just interject for a moment. So how does the off-balance sheet treatment by the federal government of Fannie and Freddie play into the pressure to resolve their status? If at well, all. I, I don't know if, um, I think they, the, the federal government receives income from Fannie and Freddie. Every loan that uh, Fannie and Freddie purchase from a lender, uh, we, they get, there's a 10 basis points charge that goes straight to uh, the federal government and then the quarterly sweeps of Fannie and Freddie. So there's a financial benefit for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac being into conservatorship. And again, um, you know, one could argue, you know, this, the 10 basis points goes through 2022, and it's very helpful. There's nothing broken in the mortgage market in terms of, um, of, of uh, you know, delinquencies and defaults. I think the delinquency rates are low. They're probably, they're not the lowest they've ever been, but there really is nothing broken. So what is there to fix from, a, from an economic perspective other than the government backing 90% of the mortgage of the loans that are issued. Would there be more urgency to resolve Fannie and Freddie if they were part of the balance sheet of the federal government? That's a hard question. They have not been yeah. uh, part of the balance sheet of the federal government. And the, the decision is either they should be or they should not be. When they were in their prior state, they were half in, half out. They were private corporations, but they had the backing or their securities, the, the full faith and credit uh, of the United States government. So in Canada, the, the typical mortgage loan is a, f it's a five year mortgage loan and it amortizes over, over 25 years now, I think. In the United States, the typical mortgage loan is a 30 year mortgage mm -hmm. loan. Why is the 30 year mortgage loan the standard in the United States? And do you expect to see other types of mortgage loans become popular in the U.S.? Well, the 30-year mortgage loan has been around for a long time, and there's a huge debate on whether it is still viable. But I think the uh, American borrowers are just wedded to the notion of having the 30-year mortgage as an option because the amortization and resultant payment are lower and they're fixed. And with the 30 year mortgage was introduced at a time when people would you know, live in the same place and work at the same jobs for 30 years. And right now 
you know, there are most people, many people are transient, especially the millennials. And you can get an amortization with a, a 30 year amortization payment with a five year arm or a seven year arm or a 10 year arm. But it just seems like the 30 year mortgage provides certainty and it provides comfort to some degree for many uh, borrowers. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I just don't see it going away. Mm -hmm. Can you can you tell us what what you expect to accomplish in your division over the next three years? I was hopeful that um, we would witness uh, housing finance reform, and I get um, I'm still hopeful that that will happen before I retire from government. Um, I. In my specific division, I think we would like to see this credit risk transfer program um, become more robust. We've got a mm -hmm. number of investors, and I mentioned that we are changing the debt issuance structure to uh, uh, one that uh, allows for uh, remote bankruptcy. It's a trust, and it also has REMIC eligible loans. So I'm hoping that we'll see more participation in that. And I'm hoping that we will see more private sector participation in the market, um, but I've been hoping that for about five years now. So I think you've already answered my next question, okay. which is when you, we might expect to see Congress address Fannie and Freddie. What was my answer? I, I think your answer was nobody knows. Well, that's right. That's right. Uh, but I, 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 I take it this is not, it's not a near-term prospect, at least. No, you never know. I mean, the Congress could change or it could be the same. There have been a number, I, I was actually going to count the number of uh, bills and legislation that have been introduced in the Congress since 2007 to address or try to tackle housing finance reform. But I just thought, what a fruitless exercise. There's a bill that's currently, it's bipartisan. It's currently been, um, I think, passed by portions of the Senate and now it's at the House, and then the House has, you know, certain members have things that they'd like to include in their view of housing finance reform. So it's just so hard to figure out what is the trigger that will move this issue and, 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 not, and not just kick the can down the road. And your guess is as good as mine on that. We're getting close to the end here, so I, there's one question I want to get to. Sure. You, you were at the FDIC in 2008. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the first issuance of cover bonds outside of Europe was done by Washington Mutual mm -hmm. in 2006. Uh, Washington Mutual failed in, I think it was September 2008, 2008. Mm -hmm. with, um, I, I think, six series of cover bonds mm -hmm. outstanding. What was the thinking at the FDIC in resolving that failed institution and, and how you were going to treat the covered bonds? Well, there was, first we didn't know what to do. Um, there were no rules governing, you know, how were covered bonds going to be treated by an FDIC receivership. When a bank or financial institution fails, the purchaser can take the entire bank, the deposits and the liabilities. They can take some of the bank, all the deposits, and some of the li liabilities or none of them. And they can pick and choose what they left behind. And, and so much as it pertains to cover bonds is based on the issuer. So how would investors who had purchased those bonds feel when this Washington Mutual failed, the bonds were not absorbed by the buyer, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase at the time, and they remained in receivership held to be sold by the government and we were very thankful and very happy that when J.B. Morgan decided to purchase uh, uh, the Washington Mutual, they took all the assets, including the cover bonds. But it did give us pause. We hadn't dealt with that issue before. We didn't know how they were going to be received. We didn't know what impact they would have on the market if FDIC as receiver were to retain those bonds and then sell them into the open market, which is what we do in receivership for the assets that are mm -hmm. not taken by the purchaser of an institution. And if I recall correctly, I think the last remaining outstanding Washington Mutual cover bond was just retired recently. It was. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> um, I, I, 
I think the last question is, um, your cover bonds have been very successful outside the United States. They, uh, they align the interests of the issuing bank and investors much more than I think securitization mm -hmm. does. Um, from a policy perspective, cover bonds would seem to be um, uh, a very effective tool um, for dealing with, with mortgage finance. How do, how do we get cover bond issuance for U.S. banks, mm -hmm. and does it simply wait on resolution of the GSEs? I don't know. I think you could um, certainly, there could be um, pilots. This cover bonds depend a lot on the issuers, and since you have the large financial institutions uh, that probably would benefit by issuing these bonds. I mean, what's the, what's the capital treatment? I think it's more favorable than Fannie and Freddie. Um, the, the bond, the, the, the loans are actually encumbered, but I think they're on balance sheet. So what's the capital treatment for uh, covered bonds? I think you need to have conversations with the regulators and also the uh, financial institutions that would issue these bonds to just do a small offering. I mean, you don't have to put your you know, whole foot in the water, just yep. put your toe in there just to see how it would be received. And again, there's nothing stopping anybody from doing a covered bonds, but this, again, it, the issue gets clouded by the GSE reform. But it seems like a number of institutions uh, could, if they so cho chose to, um, take a dip in the water and, and just see, but is the execution better than Fannie or Freddie? You know, or is capital yeah. treatment? I mean, those are all yeah. questions to be answered. Yeah. Well, certainly the borrowing rates are not going to be as good as Fannie exactly. and Freddie. Um, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, how about if I open it up for questions? Anybody in the audience have questions? Yes. Uh, We hear about um, more the, the teaser rates and yeah. these, but um, my specific question is around HELOCs. Mm -hmm. What's your take on the role that HELOCs played in uh, leading into the crisis in 2008? And the reason I ask is because in this rising rate environment, mm -hmm. we're starting to see signs of people under or with exposure to yeah. the product. So that's a very good question, and I do think that home equity lines of credit did play a role in the crisis. It was understated because it, the conversation about the uh, primary mortgage loans, the, the 228s and the 327, the teaser rates, the low doc, the no doc, the IOs, that conversation overwhelmed the other conversation that, was, that should have been taking place on the home equity line, lines of credit. And I do think that they were a contributor uh, to the crisis. And I do think that it did not that product did not get as much attention as it probably should have. And we're starting to see some of the uh, remnants of uh, not uh, dealing with that conversation right now, because many people had 10-year HELOCs, and some of them are starting to come due with you know, principal and interest payments being due. And we're starting to see, at least from what I heard, a uh, delinquency level that's probably higher than anyone anticipated in that product line. So I think that was a very good question. Any, uh, Richard. Um, well, the FDIC wasn't the primary federal regulator of um, Washington Mutual. It was the Office of Thrift Supervision. And so we didn't necessarily have a view or take a role. But I think after the, um, Washington Mutual failed, FDIC and Treasury, I wasn't there at the time, but I believe this to be true, did put out guidance on the treatment of covered bonds. And so I don't know, because it wasn't such a big part of the balance sheet, if people really paid attention to covered bonds. There was lots of conversation about what Washington Mutual was doing, but at the time, concurrently, a crisis was underway. So the focus kind of shifted. I have one question here from the audience. Um, is there any political appetite to amend the mortgage interest tax deductibility <laughs> rules? <laughs> well, and if it did happen, do you think it would help reduce the overall risk to the system? 
Oh, I don't know. You know, we just, the, the Treasury Secretary and the Congress just enacted tax reform. I mean, it's a huge legislative package. And they had conversations about the mortgage interest deduction. And the National Association of Realtors, which um, are responsible for selling mortgages, uh, there were so many people that had conversations about the interest deduction. I think what happened is they reduced the deduction and going forward, it's, I think there's like a $10,000 cap or something like that, but um, moving it completely, I think that's a huge uh, political fight. Yeah. Um, we have time for maybe one last question. In that case, let me say thank you very much, Senator. It was very nice to have you here. Nice to be really here. appreciate thank your you. remarks. Thank you.